hope my introduction is already done. So my name is uh, Kamal. I lead the practice, XR practice within Tech Mahindra, focusing on uh, developing industrial applications using this immersive technology. Uh, today, uh, this morning, I'm here to present uh, this new reality for enterprise. How XR is making impact in enterprise sector. Uh, I'm going to talk about few interesting use cases uh, which we are learning are scalable. And then also at the same time, how mature this technology is, what are these uh, challenges to adopt, adoption challenges for the enterprise side of it. And also finally, uh, I will present one case study, uh, what we have uh, built for Pinin Farina, part of uh, Mahindra Group. Um, so these are the topics I want to cover today. Um, uh, we, we have heard yesterday a couple of sessions around different applications for XR um, and then how to build it as well. And uh, after hearing so much of noise, so I think I would make this statement first before we move forward. XR isn't only for gaming, it's also an, uh, a game changer for enterprise. So before I move on, I would like to take a vote. How many of you believe it's really a game changer? Very nice, so it makes sense to go forward. Uh, yes, it is, and, uh, but what often people uh, get wrong about VR uh, is, especially in the enterprise side of it, uh, is that they believe VR is only for, or in the, for that matter, the entire XR is for gaming alone. No, the answer is uh, there are certain applications uh, various applications in industry space. People are using it in engineering, manufacturing, uh, and field services and so on. There are various applications which I could relate and there are a few more as well. And uh, one of the entry barriers I've seen with the technology being so new uh, is that people think uh, they cannot use this technology because it is coming, right, how you have to use wearables. For example, uh, when we've been presenting to our customers, so at least last year, we had to define what is VR, what is AR, what is mixed reality, we had to differentiate. That has changed now, okay? So our customers know what is the difference between these technologies. And when we offer them to, because this uh, particular technology works only when you experience it, not just seeing the slides. When we ask them to experience it, they were so hesitant because they might, they think we, we have VR sickness. The truth is no, uh, the VR comes at variable, uh, various comfort levels. You need to understand how the user, uh, how the user will feel comfort. We are not doing definitely a, a game. Uh, we need to take into account end user comfort. So some of the people, they think if they sit and take the VR experience, it's far more better for them. How do you have a minimalist or uh, an intuitive uh, a user interface is really important. So when we develop these applications, we need to keep in mind the end user, and keep in mind that the end user is an enterprise user, and he might not be uh, technology savvy. He has to focus on the use case itself, what he has to learn there, how do you have to use. So keeping all that in mind, we have to design the application. Now if you think about why everybody is excited about this technology in enterprise, why everybody wants to spend their time and money. Uh, in my view, there are various factors. So we have seen in one of the presentation yesterday, the technology existed since uh, 1957. Um, so what has changed recently? Why this buzz is coming now is because for me, uh, these tech titans, be it Microsoft or Google or even HTC, all these people have all these companies have invested money and made these HMDs, the head-mounted devices or the hardware which is required to deliver this technology more affordable, more sophisticated for, uh, for instance, means they've become sleek, they're more, more usable now in an enterprise environment, and then uh, also becoming more affordable. That's the, one of the main reasons I think the technology is gaining traction. And of course, these uh, high numbers, which are projected by analysts, 
2022, the entire XR market is going to be 56 billion. Uh, that is now because even these numbers are changing like stock market. Uh, that is going to settle down soon, we believe. But these high projections which are coming from the analysts are also making people to invest time. And then if you look at the XR software industry, software market itself, which is close to $70 billion. And then uh, if you look at the uh, wearables, the head-mounted display uh, uh, shipments, by 2022, it's going to be more than 25 million. Means the increasing rate in adoption within enterprise is giving those numbers. So I think these are the reasons why everybody is excited and uh, want to uh, uh, capture their uh, share of market. And if you look at various industries uh, within enterprise, uh, who is investing most? Uh, automotive really stands at the top. Uh, we talk about what we have experienced is automotive is more into product development. That's where they are investing heavily uh, because most of their manufacturing processes are automated. But also healthcare. Uh, I've met so many companies who are working on healthcare trainings, how do they help the people at the hospitals and so on. And retail and consumer goods. Various other industries are also uh, investing heavily. And if you look at the trend is increasing. By 2020, they want to do more with this technology. And uh, what is more important, it's okay, this we understand so many uh, industries are interested, but what are their strategic goals if you look at uh, mostly on improving the worker performance or the entire manufacturing quality. I think one of the reasons is because though these factories are become factories of the future, uh, what lies at the center of the factory floor performance is the worker itself. So this technology blends very well with improving the performance of the people at the front line. I think that's one of the reasons why it stands at the top. And then increasing the sales revenue, more to be with uh, uh, the showrooms, how do we do virtual product presentations, how do you uh, en enhance the uh, end user experience, buying experience, that is to do with that. And shortening the development cycle, it's more to do with the design part of it, that's what we have been hearing. Some of the case studies published by automotive sectors, they are able to cut down the cycle time. And improve training, training is a definitely a potential subject uh, where you can not only improving the efficiency, but you can reduce the training cost as well. Keeping the strategic goals in mind is really important uh, when we talk about the use cases, when we build those use cases for our customers. Till now, what we have seen is more of, I try to present what, the, what analysts are predicting, but with having demonstrated this, having worked with our customers closely, this is what is our view. Uh, when we look at uh, where our customers are interested to implement these technologies throughout the product cycle, right? Right from design till aftermarket. Uh, I will go into each of these uh, areas in detail in my next slides. But to quickly touch upon, so when we talk about design or the design experience, uh, performing certain design reviews within virtual reality, uh, and then some feasibility studies, and virtual collaboration, how do we combine various teams across geographies uh, to come in a VR session and then uh, review their designs. And then immersive training. Training, I don't have to elaborate more because a lot of companies are focusing in this area because immersive technologies are very powerful uh, in delivering these training modules. Uh, more than all, what I think is this will constantly engage the learner. There is no point, uh, there is no point in time where the user can distract himself because, because most of these uh, training modules are delivered through immersive head-mounted -mode, head devices. The user has to be attentive throughout the learning course. So that is one of the potential benefit I see. Um, and of course, on the manufacturing side, when we talk about training, we was more referring to the offsite trainings. When we go to the manufacturing, you can really guide the worker throughout his work process. And also, vision picking solution, how can we uh, leverage smart glass technology to improve the picking speed of the worker at the warehouse. And then sales and marketing, probably one of the 
entry areas into this technology. And service and maintenance, remote guidance, and how do we visualize asset monitoring data in VAR? So this is, these are some of the areas uh, where we see a lot of traction is coming. And then if you look at the design and the training part of it, where there we see more virtual reality and mixed reality uh, taking the lead. The adoption rates are higher over there. But when it goes beyond training, when we talk, when we talk about manufacturing and beyond, it's of course more mixed reality and augmented reality. Another thing now, okay, we have seen the analyst reports. We have understood where the customers are interested. And then is it this technology delivering any business value? It's, a, uh, it's something we need to, uh, it's very important to ensure that the use cases are going to be scalable or the technology is going to be scalable in the future. So what has happened, only recently we are seeing the customers are coming and publishing what is the benefit they are seeing in terms of numbers, not just the areas where you are implementing, they are coming out and saying after the pilot implementation, this is the business benefit we are seeing. I think it's really important and these are going to change and they are going to increase the adoption rates for other customers are also, also. This will be taken as references. Uh, when we talk about uh, design, uh, we are talking about virtual collaboration. You can do the remote design piece of it. So how we can reduce, uh, what is the element of business benefit here is, you can reduce the number of prototypes. So you can visualize your 3D in 3D. So you can visualize your three, uh, design at scale which gives us a better chance to identify any of the uh, defects or a feasibility study we can do, we can foresee what kind of problems I may encounter when it goes for manufacturing and so on. So I think that's where the technology is giving us the benefit of assessing these problems and reducing the design iterations. When it comes to training, yes, uh, we can definitely cut down the training cost. Uh, I would take one example. Uh, of a use case we are uh, talking to Mahindra's only. So they have this uh, huge uh, legacy machines in their shop floor. And the workers who are operating these machines are set for retirement. And then the knowledge, the tribal knowledge goes along with them. Now this setting procedure is so complex, even if they encourage the newcomers to come and do the setting, they are so hesitant because they're worried about the entire batch may get spoiled if they do uh, some wrong settings. So they will have to practice. Either they have to learn uh, on the job when the seniors are teaching them. They have no uh, possibility to practice before they really get into work. So practicing really in front of the machine would be too costly. So that's the reason why we selected virtual reality wherein you can allow the user to really practice virtually and build his confidence before he uh, really gets onto the work. Right? So that is one, just one example, but in the other uh, use cases or the customer use cases what we have seen, many of the times the trainees have to be taken to the shop floor uh, to actually show them how the machine is going to work because these are costly equipment, they may not have it in the classroom session. For this they will have to stop the machine uh, and so on and so forth. So all that, I'm not saying we can completely cut down that, but the number of times you have to take them to the shop floor can definitely be cut down because all that uh, environment can be virtually simula simulated in VR. You can really give the same experience what's going to have on the field. So going beyond for the, uh, if you look at that is training. So if you go to the next phase of the life cycle, it's manufacturing. So I'm not sure how clear is this picture. This is uh, part of the space shuttle, okay? So this is, I'm taking the example what is given from there with your space customers that the worker there uh, has to fix a lot of, uh, he's using the torque wrench to rivet so many, uh, uh, tighten a lot of fasteners. So each of these fastener should have a particular torque value. So if this torque value is different, that might have a huge impact for the end product. So now, what typically workers do is uh, they look at the uh, uh, instructions for each of the set of the fasteners, what is the torque value they have to apply. So they have to take their eyes off from the work they are doing 
Of course, you cannot imagine any experienced worker to remember all these values. So they will have to take their eyes off from working and then have to look at that value and then come back and perform the job. So what has happened with mixed reality is that there is a color coding. So all these uh, annotations are projected on top of the real object, helping the worker to understand what kind of value uh, he has to apply right within his field of view. You don't have to take his eyes off from the work he's doing. So you can imagine that will prove a lot of uh, productivity benefit. And also at the same time, it will reduce the number of errors which otherwise he may commit. This is one just example. So there are other examples in aerospace also where they're using for harness manufacturing. So I think where we are applying is really important to understand what kind of benefit uh, the use case can give. And then when you talk about service and maintenance, uh, I, I think this is one of the first good steps what customers are taking, uh, the remote support. Uh, we know, we, we hear this as a common problem from the customers saying that, I don't, I, I don't have expert all the time on the field. So somebody who is technician on the field needs a support from an expert who is remote. So how can we use augmented reality remote support solution to collaborate the technician on the field versus a remote expert, helping him to solve the problem, thereby you reduce the travel cost for the remote expert and also reduce the downtime of the machine itself. So if you look at manufacturing, the results are showing more than 30% improve in the, sorry, productivity of the worker, and 30%, these are the average numbers I've taken, the values are still higher than this, uh, reduction in downtime and so on. So in spite of this, uh, we really see a cautious adoption rates from the customers on the enterprise side. Uh, and then the technology is not going really mainstream. If we think about it, what are those uh, obstacles to really make this technology go scale up? Uh, there are three various groups within each enterprise. So there is business managers and then IT and then the end customer, uh, consumer itself, end user itself. So from the business point of view, they're worried about the return on investment. Show me the numbers. Technology might be exciting, but what is the use case? What kind of return on investment? Because this technology comes with a higher um, upfront cost itself because the devices are not so cheap. Uh, still, for example, a Microsoft HoloLens costs $5,000. And also the uh, development, uh, if the customer wants a purpose built specific use case from them, it comes with a specific upfront cost. So we need to have really uh, a justification for the return on investment. And then whether the use, scale, uh, use, uh, use cases are scalable, we saw a good example of how do you assist a, uh, a, a technician or a worker for maintenance procedure using HoloLens. But the question is how scalable it is. Uh, in terms of because if there is a 3D update happening, how quickly you can update your application itself. And so, so there are so many customers out there, they say, I don't have 3D at all. How do you deliver this experience to me? And then uh, the time taken for pilots and creating the proof points is also on a higher side. And then on the IT side, yes, security is one of the const uh, constraints because we might say that for the content management system, I want to use the cloud. So when we talk about cloud, the questions will come arise about whether the cloud is secured, uh, uh, there is, uh, are you using a defense cloud, or you are using a private, net, private uh, on-premises cloud, and so on and so forth. And then the privacy of the data, so whatever the data is being shared through your platform is, I, uh, has to be encrypted, otherwise customer has uh, really concern about who will misuse this data, because these uh, drawings and CAD models are really IP of the customer. And then the device management itself, we are talking about next gen mobile computing, uh, we are talking about wearables, smart glasses, they all have the capability to record and uh, take images and so on. So the, the, the question is, how do you protect this data? How do you manage these devices that really the information is not go to, going out of their customer premises? And then the end user concerns is about the uh, use comfort itself of the device. Because you think about HoloLens, it's a 600 gram device. How do you expect a worker to use it for a day long usage? Uh, think about the economics. What if he's working in an uh, environment where there is an explosion? Is it intrinsic safe? There are so many questions uh, which has to be answered on a smart glass. 
for the end user. And the, the, the safety of it, the worker thinks, if I wear these glasses, I may fall down. Is, it is blocking my view, especially true in case of virtual reality. Um, and also the safety I talked about. Um, and many of these glasses, I mean, some of the glass companies, for example, Realware has interest invested. They are, uh, you know, uh, giving away glasses, one without intrinsic safety, one with an intrinsic safety. The difference is $3,000. And then the privacy, what the workers think is that some of the use cases uh, for on-site learning, what we do is we allow the exper experienced uh, worker to record what he's doing. Now the concern from the worker is that, who's going to watch this? What if there is a flaw in whatever I'm doing? So there is a privacy concern from the workers itself. So there is a cultural aspect we need to address. And overall, what we have seen is, while the technology is able to give cool, cool experience, use cases, really moving from there to a meaningful experience is really important to scale this technology in enterprise. So having talked about all this, uh, what are those levers we think can improve the adoption rates? XR ready content, uh, the content has to be because we should not spend, it has to be automated, we understand that the CAD data uh, cannot be directly imported. If it comes to the high million, uh, high polycon, how do we optimize this data and so on. We had a session yesterday, how to do it with Pixie. I'm going to present a new case where we use that tool as well. And then it has to be device agnostic because customers, we have seen customers that I want to use, there are various smart glasses out there. The solution, what we give, they want to test different smart glasses and figure out which one suits better for their business, for their users. So your solution has to be really device agnostic. I, it, can, it, can, it has to be handled or head mounted and uh, so on. And then the enterprise ready. One of the thing is that we would have done a pilot, but when we talk about scale, how quickly, how easily I'm able to integrate this application into my backend system. How is the pull and push of data happens easily is a very, uh, uh, important topic we need to take into consideration. And then the connectivity. So the remote support uh, use case, for example. So you need to have a seamless audio video communication. You need to have a seamless uh, data sharing over the network. So we have seen they might be in a place where there is no uh, a network at all. So we really think 5G is going to revolutionize that and then with the uh, uh, 5G is going to really help a lot of applications which are derived through AR, VR. Uh, yeah, I, yes, well, another thing is the uh, use comfort for the worker himself. Uh, I, I tried to touch upon this, uh, for, especially for a day long usage. And the application point of view, when we develop applications, what we need to keep in mind uh, is how easy the application, ease of use of the application itself, how, how simple the user interface is, so that we are not making the job of the worker more complicated, but rather help them uh, with the kind of applications we're developing. Security, yeah, I touched upon it when we talk about cloud. So even there are instances where customers want to have on-premise solutions rather than a cloud solution. Um, so some of the quick takeaways is that uh, the, uh, there are great examples where there are labor intensive tasks, low volume, high complexity, and uh, high volume, small improvements. Think about the vision picking use case where you, the number of picks are more, and then they, they, if, you are, if, the, if the same worker is able to pick more items, so you can effectively handle your seasonal picks. With, the, with less, you can do more. And uh, use mobile devices to start with because customer might not be uh, you know, interesting right away jump on a smart glass or a head mounted device so we can leverage the existing uh, infrastructure which is already available. Where it doesn't work is that highly automated use cases and highly repeated uh, uh, work where, wherever the workers are doing, so there it doesn't work. It's very hard to prove the return on investment. So I have five minutes left, so I'll just quickly cover one of the case study. Uh, this is more of, a, we have seen yesterday some of the industrial examples where uh, for the maintenance and manufacturing. Uh, we will show you uh, one example what we developed for virtual product presentation for Pininfarina. This is uh, the reason why we, uh, we chose 
uh, or virtual realities because this is one of the concept car uh, designed by Pininfarina. We only have one mock-up available in Italy. So we thought the user not just to see it, but to experience it. So the best way was to use virtual reality for that matter. And also, uh, we don't have to move this mock-up to show it to the multiple users. You can all do this with virtual reality. Uh, so how did we approach with this project is that uh, we've been given the CAD data as the input. So it uh, essentially, obviously it came with a high million poly count uh, because it was built for manufacturing. And then uh, we have decimated that using Pixie. That's where we saw some advantages of these optimization techniques and tools. And then, of course, we made it photorealistic by applying some textures and shaders and so on. So here we used uh, Unity uh, high definition render pipeline and also the standard pipeline. So high definition ren render pipeline was not compatible for VR at that time, but it's changing now. So we use a standard pipeline. So what we have observed is easy import of the CAD data and then uh, model decimation very quickly. So the polycon I forgot to mention was 30 million when we received it and it was, we were able to reduce less than a million. Yeah, so uh, one of the advantage we saw was that I, I, I talked about multimodal outputs uh, with the same platform, with the same amount of work, efforts. We were able to produce output for various different formats, uh, be it a desktop interactive application or a virtual reality or even an augmented reality application. So we were able to uh, provide output for various output formats. Uh, using the same platform. That's what we see as an advantage. And uh, of course, we can custom build the VR experiences. We can custom design the user interface uh, based on the user preferences and so on. And, uh, I, I, and the solution is device agnostic as well. So I'll run the, uh, I'll run a video now before I close my session. Uh, this was a 4K younger video. Uh, later part of this video also has a virtual reality and augmented reality. So all this we rendered using the Unity High Definition Render Pipeline. So this was a desktop non-immersive interactive application what we see before is non-immersive, non-interactive. So various different output formats that's what I was trying to do in this one. So you can have this on a touch screen, uh, you can really interact with your 3D move the way you want it. Uh, rendering has already happened. So
So we are running out of time, but nevertheless, you can always come and visit our booth over here. So we are more than happy to show you the VR and AR applications live. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Uh, like I had said in the beginning, we have time for just one question per session. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. All right, then thank you. Then we can move to the next presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you.